Good morning, everyone. It's a blessing to have the opportunity to be together and gather with you this morning, that we can open up another portion of God's Word, that we can study it, that we can sing songs, that we can pray. So thankful to see everyone out this morning, to be able to come and worship. Thankful for our visitors, thankful for those that have not been here for some time, that we've all been able to gather together safely and worship Him. If you will, this morning, we'll be starting out in John chapter 12 in just a moment. In John chapter 12, looking at a character that, even by worldly standards, most people know who he is. His name is synonymous in history, and that is Judas. Judas is one that we see in the Old Testament, not in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, as one who has betrayed Christ, and that's the main thing we focus on. But I think there's a lot of lessons to learn from him in a lot of avenues of our different aspects of our life. But I want to look at a couple things this morning, looking at Judas, looking at some of the things that he made priorities and be really a cautionary tale to us as well. And what are our priorities in life and what do we focus on and what do we constantly turn to? We're going to start here in John chapter 12 and we're going to talk first and foremost about one of the things that Judas is known for and it's part of the reason he betrayed Christ was his love of money. It didn't start in passages like Matthew 26. He didn't wake up before the Passover to go to the priests to go to the leaders of Israel and say, what price will you give me for Jesus' head? That's not how it started. It started very early on in Jesus' ministry. One of the examples that we find most synonymous found in John chapter 12, let's pick up there in verse 4. But one of his disciples, that being one of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who had later betrayed him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? The oil that he's speaking of is an oil that was brought to him by a young lady and was put on Jesus' feet and was used to anoint him, and it was noted as being very costly. It was a very expensive oil. And Judas' first response when he sees the oil being used on Jesus' feet, why wasn't this sold and given to the poor? But in verse 6, Judas said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus answered and said, Let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. But the poor you have with you always. But me you do not always have. Judas had this love of money and he had this habit, it records here in John chapter 12, of theft. He had this habit of he'd been the one put in charge of the treasury and in charge of the money that the disciples had, the money that would be given to them and distributed in whatever case it was used for. He was in charge of that, and the idea we kind of get painted here in John chapter 12 is he used to skim a little bit off the top, maybe even more and more as time went on, to the point by the time we get to John, chap John chapter 16, Matthew chapter 26, Luke chapter about 17 through 20 there in there, by the end of Jesus' ministry, he's not satisfied with just taking a little bit from the treasury. He wants bigger and bigger payouts. And when he saw this act of service and love being done by this young lady, he didn't see for it for what it was. He didn't see it for the worship. He didn't see it for the care. He didn't see it for the service that she was showing to Christ. He saw dollar signs that were being rubbed into a man's feet and dripped on the floor that he would not get access to. That was how he viewed the world in many ways. Until finally he does what's one of the things he's probably most known for. Passages like Matthew 26 record it in beginning in verse 14. Matthew 26 and verse 14, this was one of the twelve, Judas Iscariot, who went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver Jesus to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time on, he sought opportunity to betray him. This flavored his existence for a short time. We don't know how long it lasted. We don't know how many hours or days that it was, but it doesn't seem like too long of a period. But there was a short period from the time that he went to the chief priest and said, how much will you give me? Till he kept looking for opportunities. When can I make the next quick dollar? That was how he lived his life for a period of time. As Jesus was preaching and teaching, and we'll talk about that more here in a few moments. 
looking for ways to earn money to betray his friend. Whether he meant to see his friend killed or whether he meant to betray his friend as some kind of charade and make some money in the background, we're not given details on. But his focus was on the earthly wealth that he could accrue. So then what about us? Do we love this world? Do we love the money that we can acquire, the things that we can obtain in this life more than Christ? Judas is not the only example that we see in just the New Testament alone of those who loved earthly wealth more than Christ. We could talk about Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts who wanted not only earthly wealth but wanted the fame that came with supposedly giving everything that they had to God while keeping some of it back. We could talk about Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4. One of the most notable characters following Paul in many of his ministries, Demas was one who Paul notes as a fellow worker, as a brother in Christ, as one who has given much of his life to serving God and to helping Paul and to teaching and spreading the word until we get to 2 Timothy. And one of the betrayals that seemed to have hit Paul very hard towards the end of his life was Demas, who he notes there in 2 Timothy 4, having loved this present world, has deserted me. He's deserted me. He's deserted God in serving him because he's fallen in love with the money, with the wealth, with the things that he can acquire on this earth. Brethren, what price do we have that we would betray Christ for? Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6 this time. 1 Timothy chapter 6 is one of those passages, especially in the New Testament, that talk to great extent about money, about both the good that can come from it, as well as the dangers that can come from it. Specifically, 1 Timothy 6, beginning there in about verse 6, talks about the love of money and the attitude that can become very dangerous, very sinful, and very deadly if we don't put a rein on it. 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 6, Paul writes to Timothy saying, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Paul says there is something to be said. It is a godly attitude to be content with what we have on this earth. Not that it is a bad thing to want to get more wealth. Not that it is a sinful thing to have much wealth. There's a lot of good that can be done with it. In fact, he talks about that in some of the previous verses. But at the end of it all, the goal should be to be content with what we have. That yes, if we need more money, if we don't have enough to pay our bills, to put food on the table, to own the house, to keep a roof over our head, whatever the case may be, yes, strive to take care of yourself, have a good work ethic, go and earn what you need to earn, but at the end of the day, don't let the jealousy get into the point where you're like Judas. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For at the end of it all, Paul writes in verse 7, we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Yes, having food and clothing, verse 8, with these we shall be content. At the end of it all, Paul says, we don't really need that much. He doesn't even say the three things that we often reiterate, food, clothing, and shelter, or the things we need. He says, no, with just food and clothing, I'll be content. I'll be able to move on to the next day. I'll be able to be dressed. I'll be able to have something to put on my back. I'll be able to be modest. I'll be able to go out and still serve God and still do what I need to do. With these, we shall be content. That should be enough that we need to strive for. It's not that, some have taken this passage and twisted it to the point, that you need to give everything away until the only thing you have is food and clothing. Don't mistake me and take it to that extreme. But at the end of all, in whatever state I am, as he said in Philippians chapter 4, I learned to be content. I learned that no, I don't need to be the wealthiest man alive to own the biggest mansion, 
to have the best food brought before me every day, to have the fanciest clothes, to obtain every earthly possession I could ever want, because at the end of it all, I can't take those things with me. No, Paul continues in verse 9, those who desire to be rich. Those who cannot be content with what they had. Those that keep pursuing the things of this life those who desire to be rich, it leads down a dangerous path. Because those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. When that becomes a focus, it starts... Maybe much like Judas, and I know brethren that have fallen into this, that are treasuries of the congregation, that started just by taking the loose change that was put into the basket on Sunday. That's how it started. At the end of the day, maybe a little bit less now than it used to be. Money used to be a more prevalent thing. Checks tend to be a little bit more prevalent now than actual cash for some congregations. But at the end of the day, he would steal a couple dollars, maybe at most, out of the treasury. But then it started, well, I'm just going to take it to a round number. So it's always going to be a zero at the end of that balance that gets put into the bank every single week. Then it started, he ended up taking a little bit more time over time over time until he was eventually caught. It was estimated he stole thousands of dollars over a period of years from the congregation. It starts with something small. And then we desire to get more and more and more until we find ourselves drowning in sin, destruction, and pursuing things that are harmful. It's the desire that hooks so many people into the lottery. I desire to be rich, so I'll throw thousands of dollars at it with the minuscule astronomical chance that I'll hit it big. Many people live in poverty chasing after some big amount that they think they'll win it easy one day. Do you know what happens to 99% of the people that get that amount of money? They blow it in just a short amount of time. I worked with an elderly lady at Arby's. It was my first job in high school. She won over $2 million at the lottery. Not five years before I started working there. In less than a year, she was back at Arby's, bought a trailer that was falling apart on her. Her health was declining rapidly because she had blown it all and she still spent most every paycheck going down to the corner gas station and buying lottery tickets. Her car was full of them. She kept wanting to hit it bigger. She'd fallen into the snare that, no, I can keep winning bigger and bigger. She really fell into the trap, and she'd tell you, I won once, surely I can win it bigger. The Powerball in Kentucky is up to the billions now. She chased it until she died. Brethren, so many chase this love of money that that's why it says there in verse 10, you put that verse in its context, the love of money the desire, the chasing, the pursuit of, no, I can keep get, making it bigger and bigger and bigger is the root of all kinds of evil. For which some have even strayed away from the faith in their greediness and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And sometimes it's not just the dollar amount that we get fixated on. Sometimes it's, well... I'm not going to make it a priority wherever I work that I want time off when it comes to worship. I was raised that way. If you're going to go for a job, if you're going to look for a job before I wanted to become a preacher, look for a job. I made it a requirement at a job, and if at all possible, I want off on Wednesday nights and on Sundays. If you need me to, I will come in Sunday afternoons and work a short shift. I'll do whatever I can, but I want off very frequently required me to sacrifice every single Saturday I would have ever had off. But I wanted to work in that field 
But I also wanted to have the ability to know when I need time off to go to worship, that's a priority for me. Some people don't have that priority. Maybe that's a price that we're willing to give up on. Or maybe we say, just a few more years and I'll get raised to the next promotion, to the next status at work, and then I'll be able to say, well, now I can take Sundays off. And I've known brethren that have flat out said, no, I'm fine working every single Sunday because when I retire, then I'll be able to come to worship every single Sunday. They spent 60 years with that kind of attitude. And some of the brethren have had the attitude, no, I'll do that, and then I'll start coming to worship, and then when they finally did retire, they never came back in the building. The attitude and focus in our life, we have to be watchful on. Working a job to pay our bills, to have just the food and clothing, is not the sinful part. The sin can come in when it takes precedent over God and over serving God having to work on the occasional Sunday or having to be called in or working in fields my dad did and my mom did that on occasion they had to work a Sunday. But it was not their first choice and they did everything they could to not have to work on Sundays. But if you go in and you don't care, we can find ourselves very quickly, maybe without realizing it, Starting down the path, well, maybe it's not that big of a deal that I don't go, that I don't worship with the brethren, that I don't partake of the Lord's Supper, that I don't go be with the brethren, and we can find ourselves very quickly on a slippery slope just like Judas did. I'll start with making small sacrifices here, but eventually I'll I'll turn around and it'll be fine. We have to be watchful of these things, brethren. We have to really sit down and consider these things, and we need to be raising the next generations to put that in priority. More and more, a lot of workplaces are open on Sunday and are requiring work on Sundays. And so that needs to continue to be something that we need to be watchful for. I have heard brethren flat out tell me that's anti-American to say that. Because the American dream is to put your nose to the grindstone and pick yourself up by your bootstraps and work 40, 50, 60, 70 hours a week until you get to the point that you can retire and you have it all. I've had brothers and sisters in Christ tell me that. Brethren, at that point, you found your price that you would betray Christ for. You've put your work over God, over worshiping Him, over serving Him. That doesn't just start one day we wake up and say, nope, I'm going to actually take up, pick up some extra time at work and I'm going to go work extra weekends and I'm going to go take that time rather than serving God. It starts oftentimes from a young age that we've got to get those priorities straight. Judas started somewhere early on in Jesus' ministry taking little bits from the treasury until it led to that point in Matthew 26 that no, I will betray one of my best friends, I will betray my Savior for 30 pieces of silver. Don't let that love, that desire, even begin to take root. And that's where we have to step back and reflect, first and foremost, on ourselves. Where do our priorities lie? It needs to not be on the things that we cannot take with us when we die. As nice as they are for a short time, they're not worth it. But the next thing that we also have to ask ourselves is, are worship focused or is it distracted, much like Judas? Turn with me to another passage there in John chapter 13. John chapter 13, we're again setting the scene here for how we're supposed to be worshiping, and Jesus is trying to really set the tone for worship there. I'm in Luke chapter 13. John chapter 13, pardon me. John chapter 13, this is right before the Passover feast. Right before Judas is eventually going to betray Jesus, but before the Passover feast even begins, Jesus is trying to set the tone and the attitude for their worship. 
Judas isn't the only one distracted here. The other disciples are distracted as well, arguing over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, and there's some infighting there even among the rest of the apostles. But Jesus starts there in verse 1, before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in this world, he loved them to the end. And the supper being ended, and the devil having already put it into the heart of Jesus Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, that he had come from the Father and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet, to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, why are you washing my feet? But Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not now understand, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. But Jesus answered and said to him, If, you, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. There had already been fighting during the Passover feast. Jesus had been trying the entire time. They're supposed to be worshiping. We're supposed to be remembering what God has done for us, the Israelites, back in Exodus, that he passed over us and he delivered us out of Egypt. That's a time of worship that they were supposed to be following. And during that entire time of worship, there had been infighting. During the time when he tried to set the precedent for the Lord's Supper, there was fighting and there was arguing and there was distractions going on even among his own apostles. So Jesus is still trying to bring them back to focus. We're here to worship. I'm trying to give you lessons before I pass. My time, he knows, is at an end. I'm trying to show you that we need to be servants that our focus doesn't need to be on each other, on the petty things that we're fighting for. We need to be focusing right now on God. But they're too distracted. All the while, as the feet washing is going on, as Jesus is instituting the pattern that's going to be later become the Lord's Supper, as He's trying to give them lessons this entire time, some few last words before He's taken to the cross, For some of them, the last words they hear before he's taken to the cross. One of them, Judas, is focused in seeking opportunities to betray him. Verse 19 of Matthew 26. So the disciples did as Jesus directed them, and they prepared the Passover. And when evening has come, he sat down with the twelve. And now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. They were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me into the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes, just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he answered and said to him, You have said it. During this entire worship period. Judas is running through his mind when is going to be a good opportunity to betray Christ. When is the time going to be opportune that I can go, that I can get the chief priest, that I can get the mob, that I can bring them to Christ, and that I can earn my paycheck. That's his entire focus. When it should have been on God, on the worship, on the Passover, on Jesus' own words. So brethren, again, I ask, is our worship focused? Is it disciplined? Is our attention on God this morning even? Because there's a lot of things that can distract us. Another passage I I didn't put in here, but if there's a problem with your brother, what's Jesus say to do when you come to the altar? Go, return, Deal with the issue with your brother and then come back and bring your sacrifice. Over and over, an emphasis is placed on our focus in worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when Jesus is talking, I'm sorry, when Paul is talking about the Lord's Supper and reckons back to Matthew 26 in which Jesus instituted it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, there's an emphasis placed there on part of worship. 
What is your focus during the Lord's Supper? 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 27, Therefore, Paul writes, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. For he who drinks for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are sick and weak among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. For when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned within the world. One of the focuses and the problems that they were having in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is they were not focused in their worship. And one of the things he talks about is the Lord's Supper. They're eating, they're drinking, they're partying, they're playing, they're having fun, and the attention is not on Christ Jesus and what He has done and the sacrifice that He has made. There is no thought or reflection on their own state of whether or not they're in sin, of whether or not they're worthy to come, to worship, to partake of the Lord's Supper, to focus on what is being said, on what is being done. The emphasis of Paul is to know, have some self-discipline and examine yourselves. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning there in verse 18. Another passage that Paul talks about, the discipline and attitude in worship. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 18, Paul writes, Do not be drunk with the wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, having the focus to submit to one another in the fear of God. As we've come together this morning and as we've sung and even the comments were made by the song leader, pay attention to the words that we're singing. Pay attention to the lessons that we're teaching one another as we're all participating in that worship. Don't let it be distracted, even maybe singing songs that you've sung a hundred times or more. There's still lessons there to be learned, to be focused on, to be reminded of that we're here to worship. Let us turn our attention to God. Let us turn our attention to each other and how we're worshiping and building and addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I understand there's a lot to be distracted by in life. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on in my own life. Alyssa and I are working on trying to buy a house right now. Some of you know that, some of you may not. I think we counted, it's either been six or seven offers we've put down on houses in the last seven weeks or so. Housing market's crazy right now, if you didn't know. We've rushed out of the building on Sunday mornings to go and look at a house or to go to sign paperwork before a deadline finishes so that we can try and get an offer in on a house. We've waited nearly every Sunday for the last two months. Okay, we might hear back today. We might hear tomorrow. We've got an offer we're waiting to hear on right now. Did we get this one? That can't be all we're focusing on during worship. The time is, no, come, sit down, try and put all those things out of our mind to the best of our ability. Take a moment to be refreshed, to be reminded I serve a great and awesome God, that He is in control and that I can leave it in His hands. I've done everything else I can. Many of us have and have had family members that are sick and that we're concerned about. We have family gatherings that we're planning and other things that we're going to go do after worship services, and it's so easy to be focused on the many noises that can be happening. And worship just becomes, well, that's, that's that thing we do on Sunday morning. We've showed up, we've taken the Lord's Supper, we've worshiped, we've droned out the preacher for 30 minutes, and then we've gone home. There's a worry right now, even from some of our own brethren, about the health of the world and health right now. And we've gathered together in a crowd, some of you for the first time in over a year. And there can be a concern and a worry there. Well, 
I hope I didn't make a mistake by coming to worship and getting sick or getting someone else sick. There's so many things that Satan can distract us with. If we let those things creep in and take over, we're doing the same thing that Judas was doing. We're missing the lessons, the edification, the challenges that we've studied in Bible classes, in our prayers, in our song, in our sermons, and in our worship. Let us come together, as the Hebrew writer said, for the purpose to worship. Really, with the recognition, the Hebrew writer says, he's writing at a perilous time for the first century Christians. He recognizes at that time, life was hard. The Christians were being persecuted. There was so much to worry about then as there is today. The Hebrew writer placed an emphasis, though, in verse 23, that's why we come together. In verse 23 of Hebrews chapter 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much more as you see the day approaching. The Hebrew writer is writing in a period that he recognizes life is hard, it's chaotic, there's so much going on, the reason we've come together is not only to worship our God, but to uplift one another. To stir up love and good works. To remind one another that we can make it through this, that we have each other, and more importantly, we have our God. I've gone through many spiritual ruts in just this last year. Through isolation, through stress through losing family members, through seeing brethren of mine who have walked away from the faith. I know I'm not alone in that. But I'm so encouraged to be with the brethren, to meet in person, to worship together, to be uplifted. I hope I can do the same for you. Brethren, it's not just Hebrews 10 and 25 is talking about coming together and don't forsake the assembly. That is a part of that. If you're not here, you have a hard time being encouraged and you have a hard time encouraging us. No, there is that part of that, but there's also the part of it. You can physically be here and you're not worshiping with the saints. You could be doing as Jesus talked about in Matthew 15 and verse 8. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. There have been times I have physically been in the building on Sunday morning, on Sunday evening, on Wednesday night, and my head and heart were not there. And it's on those times that even more so, we've got to take a step back, reflect on what's really important, on what our worship looks like right now and make sure that I'm putting the focus and the emphasis on God, on Christ, on my worship, on uplifting the brethren around me and on being uplifted by them. Not worshiping like Judas in a time where we should be coming together and being uplifted and remembering what God has done for us and thinking about the sin that he's going to leave and commit as soon as possible. If that's our attitude, then I want to propose to you that we're really just pretending. We're maybe showing up to a building out of habit. Because we refuse to look at ourselves, we refuse to examine ourselves, and we just continue in the sinful pattern that we're in. Matthew chapter 26, if you'll turn back with me there yet again. This time pick up with me there around verse 47. Verse 47, the worship is ended. Jesus has gone to the garden. 
He's talked with some of the disciples that he had there with him, and they've fallen asleep while he's praying and really agonizing over what he knows he's about to do. And in verse 47, picking up in Matthew 26, And while he was still speaking, that is Jesus, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great, came with a great multitude with swords and clubs, with the chief priests and elders of the people. Now his betrayer had given them a sign, saying, Whoever I kiss, he is the one, seize him. Immediately Judas went up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. But Jesus said to him, Friend, why have you come? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. Jesus didn't ask that question because he was fooled by Judas in that moment. He knew his heart. He knew why Jesus had come. Sorry, he knew why Judas had come. Pardon me. He was not being fooled. If you're following Christ with this kind of same attitude, you're not fooling him. He knows your hearts. He knows where your priorities lie, whether it be on the physical, whether it be distracted, whether it be, no, I'm showing up to please friends or family or neighbors or loved ones, but I'm going to continue in the same patterns of sin that I've been in. Whatever that case is, you can fool some people, but you're not fooling God. If you look at 1 John chapter 1 there in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness... We lie and do not practice the truth. I think Judas at this point thought himself very clever. Thought that he was getting away with stealing some from the treasury that he'd been put in charge of. I think he believed that he was going to get away with it. Perhaps he even believed as he showed up into the garden that his acting would be so good that Jesus would get away and that he could continue to still be one of the apostles and pretend, maybe to be shocked, who knows, that Jesus was taken away by a crowd. We don't know what was in Judas's thoughts. I do think he was pretending and fooling himself that he was okay. And ultimately, he found out and finally came to the realization he was not. He was pretending to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ, to be a servant of God, when ultimately he was walking in darkness and he could not have fellowship with God. Brethren, I don't want us to be in the same situation. I don't want to find ourselves in that harmful situation where we're showing up to brethren and pretending to be their brothers and sisters in Christ, that we care about them, that we love them, that we want to help them, that we want to greet one another with a holy kiss. But it's just a mask that we put on for a few moments every week. 1 John chapter 3, again, beginning there in verse 15. John writes, Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, because he has laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our own lives for the brethren. But if whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Sums up kind of Judas' whole character there, in my opinion. He does not care spiritually, about his fellow apostles and brethren or about Jesus. He doesn't care physically about them. He's more worried about the wealth that he can obtain on this life that soon moth and rust will destroy. Brethren, are we living like Judas? I pray that is not the case. If you've been distracted by the things of this life, I hope this is a reminder to us. It's been a reminder to me even in this past year, even in these past few months, as a lot of things have pulled me in different directions, physically on this earth, spiritually helping different brethren in this congregation and from around the country with friends with some very big issues. I hope it's helping you to refocus like it's helping me. 
Jesus said in Matthew 6 and verse 33, a passage hopefully many of you are familiar with, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all of these things, the spiritual and the physical blessings that He'd spent the last couple chapters talking about, will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. It's so easy to make God a second priority and worry about a million things in this life. Because it's right in front of our face. Satan's making sure that we notice the things that we have to deal with. Don't make God a second, a third, a fourth, a seventeenth priority. Because Satan has a really nasty habit of throwing a million things at us at once. Put our trust in God that He will take care of us. He will do what we need. Don't come to worship. Don't come to fellowship with the brethren. Don't come pretending to be a servant of His planning to still leave in the same sinful state that you may have showed up in. Don't continue the same patterns and habits that are sinful after you leave worship services. If you've reflected on yourself and you find yourself living, acting, worshiping, focusing on things of this life like Judas, then correct that. Hebrews chapter 6, begin with me there in verse 4. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew themselves again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. This is not a passage saying that once you sin as a Christian then you've fallen short forever and there's no more hope. This is a passage saying if you continue in the same patterns that you've been in after you become a Christian and think that you will be saved, you are wrong. This is a passage telling you if you have betrayed Christ, there will be no other Savior, there will be no other sacrifice, there will be no other gospel, there will be no other way to worship. This is your chance of salvation. Worship, serve, and follow God. There will be no other avenue of salvation. There will be no other Savior. There will be no other gospel. This is it. If you plan to be a Christian while also continuing to serve Satan, then you're just twisting the knife into Jesus even more. You're crucifying him yet again. Don't live like Judas. Repent and turn back to God. Come to Christ, be forgiven, make things right. Don't do like Judas tried to do in Matthew 27. He went to the spiritual leaders of the age. He confessed, I've sinned. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 3, Judas' betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful. He brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chiefs and to the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. He finally woke up and realized what he'd been doing was wrong. There's some part of him that wanted to make it right, but he went about it in the wrong way. Went to the wrong people. Because their answer was, what is that to us? You see to it. You take care of it. That wasn't the response that they should have been given as the chief priests. That was not the response of people who cared about him. So he took that in verse 5. He threw down the pieces of silver in the temple. He departed and he went and hanged himself. We don't preach lessons like this and parts of lessons like this to make you feel guilty and just make you feel bad. 
Trust me, I'm one who can internalize a lot of guilt and hold on to it and not forgive myself. So you drive yourself crazy. When you realize that you've sinned as a Christian, the call is to turn back to God. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and the lesson is yours. First Timothy chapter 2, let's pick up there in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We've talked about, if you've been a part of the Sunday morning studies, looking at Moses and him being the mediator between himself and the people and how powerful an image that is. Jesus is doing the same thing, but on an even grander scale. I can promise you, Jesus' desire was not that Judas became remorseful to go and hang himself. Because that doesn't fit with the mind of God or the mind of Christ. His desire was that Judas would have come, repented, and asked for forgiveness and stood alongside Paul and Peter and John and James and so many others and done much work in the kingdom. Unfortunately, that's not what Judas did. But his desire for you, if you find yourself in a sinful situation and a distracted situation of making God not the first priority. His desire is that all men be saved, including you and including me. If there is sin in your life this morning, you've been given another opportunity. You've been given another hour. And this may be the last that you have the opportunity to correct that. If there is a need for that this morning, take this opportunity. Either by becoming a Christian, and obeying God, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. Or as a Christian who has gone astray, to come back to Christ. To ask for forgiveness, and He will forgive you, and He will plead on your behalf to God that you be forgiven. You will be forgiven. The angels in heaven will rejoice and we will rejoice. So whether those things need to be done privately this morning by praying to God and asking for forgiveness, or publicly by coming forward and becoming a Christian, or confessing sin that has brought shame upon the name of God, whatever that case may be this morning, please take this opportunity to make things right if you need to by coming forward now as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.